a true friend turns visible at the time of need and how many are visible to you can give a great definition for your life by this note i would like to start this episode and we have with us vibhav as a guest you know uh, i did a post podcast before last week about uh, covid-19 pandemic wave 2 and wave 3 that is uh, are we blindfolded and especially with regard to the international affairs of india so uh, we just thought that we'll find an another armenian person to speak upon this and uh, this here we have vibhav an uh, student of international affairs and a research scholar who can give us a bulk of information welcome anna and uh, Thank you very much for accepting our request and being here on our show. Welcome. Thank you, Punesh. It's my pleasure. Yeah, uh, let us deep dive into the topic directly. So, my question is: I would like you to give a clearance to listeners or the viewers about what is the current situation of international relations of India. Once after the first wave, what is the present situation of India on to the international relations perspective? Okay, uh, so first thing is that we need to understand here is that international relations are always dynamic. So you might have certain successes and you might have certain disappointments. Uh, you might not get the expected results as it is. Like for example, um, during the beginning of second uh, wave, we expected the United States to offer certain raw materials that could be helpful in the vaccine production within our own country. But we know that they all they already quoted something like um, domestic constraints as a reason as to why they had to stop the supply so i'm just telling you uh, a lot of disappointment disappointments happen but at the same time uh, we need to look at certain factors that come into place as to why these things happen and most of the time it may not be highlighted in the media anyway you asked me about the pandemic and uh, also the post pandemic world we are yet to reach there so we do not know what is a post pandemic world uh, but you can clearly say that we are already seeing a changing global uh, you know global order uh, so what is this global order so you know the world order so the first thing you need to understand is that during the cold war you had uh, a largely bipolar world which was uh, led by the united states and the ussr russia asked while ussr correct uh, then after ussr collapsed you had a brief period where americans were the unipolar power the superpower in the world which emerged out of uh, cold war uh, but in no time emerging economies like india came up even japan was at the top so and brazil was coming up so you had a multipolar world also emerging right but then as you know during 2008 there was a financial crisis across the world uh, which kind of put a dent on other economies like let's say even the united states japan even brazil uh, but if you look closely countries like india and china was not really badly impacted as such china especially because in fact china is one country that took a lot of opportunity in coming up during the 2008 crisis and that somewhat speaks about this country uh, it might be authoritarian in its nature but when it comes to taking strategic opportunities uh, in a world that demands a kind of response where you need to make the maximum out of it uh, china is one country that has been doing pretty well since the last two decades or so anyway now that the pandemic is here you see everybody being affected every other country including china but i think the, Ch- uh, the chinese have taken a minor damage comparatively ever since joe biden took power and i have my reasons to criticize the biden administration for this but it's like you have declining world power that is the united states which was already experienced uh, a decade ago uh, during obama's time during bush's time as then now you have india which is affected by the pandemic but you already have had a declining economy since 2012 and not 2014 as people tend to say uh, but it has been hammered left and right by the pandemic uh, then you have china which took a beating due to the fact that it became the origin of the virus i mean uh, that was the origin but it somewhat tried to uh, lobby at the international stage as to how it is not responsible and how other countries are more responsible for this been 
problematic with its neighbors including with india as you know we have had a standoff in uh, ladakh last year like at the line of actual control so you see the kind of trends that we have been seeing and india has a lot to play in this changing world order we need to find a place yeah i mean, uh, I, i wanted to ask you with regard to one particular doubt i mean i usually before doing any podcast i upload it on my status and uh, i collect responses if any and um, can i be liberal enough to ask you about what you have view upon not permitting indian vaccines it's quite trending now from past a day or two uh, that um, india's vaccine are not getting permitted and uh, there is a international politics into this and china is into that there are a lot controversies like this what what do you want to say about it okay uh, so one thing is that it is all, already known that india is known as a pharma like you know it's a big powerhouse when it comes to pharmaceutical companies and producing vaccines at a large scale in a short period of time something that we can do but we have not been able to do it if you look at uh, things slowly uh, you know closely you will see that companies like moderna and pfizer i mean these are big companies in the united states right so uh, they would want access to larger markets in india which is of course 1.4 billion people or so until we wait for the next census to come in so a lot of pressure goes into even the indian companies uh, to try and you know smother down their Uh, production scales as well when it's not supposed to happen uh, we have our own domestic companies to cater to and uh, we have to go ahead with it so the trending is something uh, which will be pushed forward by these companies all together uh, it's purely business interest i guess and i guess you might be having a, an idea as to who will be yeah. behind us uh, but uh, if i had to bring in a vaccine diplomacy uh, you would clearly know as to india had kind of supplied vaccines to the rest of the world right to around 70 countries millions of doses for which you still receive some criticism as to why did you even export it when you needed uh, vaccines for the, the domestic consumption but the thing is you need to understand is that uh, we cannot run any form of politics in you know in an emotional sense or in an heightened sense of emotions because at the end of the day if you are receiving some oxygen cylinders or ventilators or something you need to have some consideration of the fact that uh, the government at the end of the day was successful in uh, pushing forward its diplomatic tentacles uh, i had a very next question in this regard because uh, you know we know that a friend in need is a friend indeed and we have followed it and do you think that it had paid us back can you give instances to prove that uh, to our viewers okay uh, so one thing is this adage does not work in international politics and i would like to quote um, it was just uh, an uh, you know instance that i gave so i mean i mean i understand what you're trying to say it's after all uh, a language that which is which is approachable to people and which is understandable to people uh, but as the former us secretary of state who is like the equivalent of india's external affairs minister in position that's what i meant uh hendrik kissinger uh he said there are no permanent friends or foes there are enduring interests so you need to understand that when you are dealing with different governments you are actually more concerned about your self interest and you look into that but it's more of a win win game your idea might be a zero sum game where you achieve the maximum and ensure you know minimum losses or something but win win is a situation which is most likely to happen because you know the other country is also not going to let you down that's the art of diplomacy it happens like that uh, is it practical can you uh, give any instances to convince that in a you know habitual way okay um, if i had to Wait, I, I'll have to. T- I'll get back to this later because there are plenty of exa- examples. But what is suitable is something that needs to come front, right? Yeah. Okay. So one thing is that. Okay, I, I guess I got an example, so you can go ahead with it. So when it comes to the Israel-Palestine issue that's been going on since the last few weeks, you would have seen this Twitter trend going on in India. Hashtag India stands with Israel. Hashtag India stands with Palestine. Now yeah. that's the public opinion, but you should see the power of social media. It has. 
literally bypass the traditional forms of diplomacy and it puts a lot of pressure on the governments and its diplomatic teams in place that is why india in one sense is sensitive about being very open to israel although we have a very good understanding at the ground level uh, like you know we have something called back channel talks where everything doesn't come out in front, uh, in the media it is discussed and forgotten or you can say it is carried out that way so even just few days back uh, one of the israeli envoys she happened to say that you know we had an understanding uh, about the situation and uh, india has been supporting us that was a language she was been using if you want to know who is a true friend in my sense uh, in my uh, perspective it is israel in the sense that it has given us defense technology it has given us um, you know the best of uh, technologies in agriculture which you know drip irrigation is coming from israel even when you need uh, solar panels meant to heat water in your house it comes from israel so there are so many innovations that we have benefited from israel and we have patents and what not with them uh, they have their companies here which are giving jobs to us Uh, but at the same time uh, you know it is about a deeper understanding between the two nations as to how you can make the maximum out of it one of the uh, common concerns that is plagued for both the countries happens to be islamic terrorism uh, if israel has to cope up with it every other day using unconventional tactics india happens to face the same thing in kashmir right so it shows that there is there are common factors as to where you can cooperate maximum benefits or minimum losses or however you want to put it international relations always depends on what kind of connectivity we have between the states yes and uh, pointing on to this topic can you uh, please give us a brief on uh, what might be the the decorum of india in coming sak sak okay sakes. so there are some events that are happening or have happened which you cannot escape from and i think that will be the dominant discourse in sark for example uh, the us withdrawal of troops from afghanistan will be the center stage and as a result you know that the taliban is getting stronger day by day in afghanistan and kind of cornering kabul on all the sides they are capturing district by district these days um i guess in the last one week or so they captured two or three districts all together despite it calls for ceasefire nothing is working really so once the us leaves more or less left already uh, you might have few troops there who are still trying to exit uh, via central asia but the idea is that if the us leaves it leaves a huge vacuum of power in afghanistan who will take control of this country as in terms of the security apparatus because you know very well that the afghan government and its armed forces is not very well equipped to try and mitigate the threat that is in front of them that is the taliban as well as isis there are countries like india pakistan russia iran china there are so many countries that are having stakes in afghanistan i don't see china going anywhere but certainly pakistan has major benefits there that's what i think you saw that india and pakistan were trying to reestablish or rather say normalize its ties that was strained since modi took power and you know you had uri you have had uh, balakot you have had patan kot and all of that uh, when all these things happened uh, india was more of using this tone i mean that was actually modi's phrase that blood and um, water cannot flow together so which is basically indicating at uh, indus water or so that is what we say meaning that you can't have terrorism and peace talks going at the same time you first solve terror and then we will go ahead with the talks so that was clear language from uh, the indian government at the end of the day uh, but i guess the pandemic has made us reassess our stance towards this issue where now we look at normalizing ties with pakistan because we know the kind of pressure that came from the chinese on in ladakh and uh, economic problems that we have had resulting from nationwide lockdown in the first um, wave and also the subsequent lockdowns that we are having in different different states today so we need to look at other options of course pakistan is an unreliable country in the end it might go back on its prom- on its pledge we know it but do we have a choice is a question it is not a position of weakness it is more so to look at other avenues to try and make it 
easier for us you have had farmer protests you have had ca protests last year so these are internal disturbances whether it is having a hand at the international stage or not at the end of the day you need to look at every other factor and try and see which is more flexible enough to uh, you know cope up with and to solve okay. reset uh, resetting of ties with pakistan might be on cards in sark and that could be uh the inauguration can be in form of prime minister modi himself visiting islamabad that is highly expected when the prime minister visits i guess that will be a clear signal as to what our direction is yeah. but let us see how it goes actually this platform of mine this unit of my foundation works basically upon soft skill development and uh, life coaching i just want to wanted to say that despite of all the diversities into our ideologies or whatever our do's or whatever we unite only when fear comes yeah even the rivals get united when we have fear down below us and that fear is created by the nature now and we are in a situation where we must be uni- united but whereas it takes a lot intensity to create that hype of you know unity among us keeping away all these things i just wanted to ask you that why is this knowledge necessary because uh, we are in a situation that if i am good that's a great thing if my family is good that's a great thing then why do we get into all these things okay if you're talking about why we need to know about the outside world when we have problems at yeah, home in general uh, why are we mean, doing this uh, so the thing is you look at the world out of curiosity is general awareness that you need to know something happening in the world so that you can try and imbibe examples at a domestic level for example even when it comes to pandemic you know that there was a lot of focus on taiwan you saw that there was a lot of focus on singapore being a, a model for tackling covid Uh, in between you had uh, no, india as an example but you know how it ha- turned out to be in the end but new zealand turned out to be such an example which was um, like a model for tackling covid so you tend to learn from it uh, and a layman will anyway look at the positives and negatives but he, he will go on the extremes he will not look at the middle part he will not look at the nuances and you can't blame him entirely because uh, that is the power of media in the end that's the projections that come from it and media has its own ways to try and push it in certain ways but you know the language used in diplomacy and the language used in media are two different things actually if you say one is outright one is very nuanced so that is one second i had to say that international politics and whatever is happening in our lives in general is not a life of black and white it is always filled with gray areas the gray areas are what we call as the uncertainties we do not know how the conditions are going to favor us how the conditions are going to uh, be a problem for us so we need to be up for the challenges every day and that's the reality that we need to stick with like i said in the beginning i told you that the problems that we have had with the united states and just not that uh, a us navy warship that just sailed through uh, lakshadweep uh, in the exclusive economic zone a couple of months back was uss john paul jones which is a guided missile destroyer so the thing is if you do a bit of research you will know that the us navy has actually conducted these maneuverables many times in the past okay but the thing is that they did not publicly announce it but this time what did they do they put it on their website on the 7th uh, 7th fleet uh, us navy website uh, and it clearly mentioned that we are opposing or something we are opposing india's excessive claims to uh, its maritime something uh, so that that's a language used now it was shocking because the language used is the same language used at china <laughs> that you look at south china sea and uh, every time there is a freedom of navigation operations uh, the us navy says that we, this is international waters you cannot do anything we will we will move our navy china says these are our waters territorial waters you cannot come in right it's the same case here and india and us need is a, are two important countries that are needed in this uh, issue of containing china's rights right but why why is this happening this is where you need to understand as public in general uh, you know one of the 
common view points that i get to hear is that russia is a very good friend of india and united states is not trustworthy and all which is kind of true because we still do have this socialist hangover that you know is the nostalgia that we were helped in 1971 war and all that but at the end of the day what will russians offer today as i mentioned you have enduring interests so are they going to give you weapons that are of high quality and are they going to give it or are they going to be as good as the weapons that are pro- provided by americans i i don't think so like Uh, you know the quality of weapons that comes from the united states although they might be expensive but they are really good and they are they stay for a longer time uh, you buy russian equipment you tend to uh, it might well it might well as well be a funeral so uh, that that's the situation that we're in so a lot of answers tend to be disappointing that is why i said always look at the fact that it is in gray areas and not black and white right like i said you know one of the factors that comes into place is optics where you look at uh, your newspaper and see two leaders smiling and uh, you know shaking hands probably prime minister modi goes one step ahead by hugging his um, you know uh, leaders and all now this a virtual conference is a different thing so i i hope he's missing all these events <laughs> but but these are just optics as i said it's something for you to look at the world and the press releases is just probably 5 to 10% they would have just said that we would have discussed about technology uh, or information technology defense and stuff like that and you would have got certain points under these major areas like what what are the agreements that you have signed but you wouldn't have known exactly what would have been talked about so that remains classified and that's that remains for all the countries at the end of the day unless your wikileaks comes out with certain information from time to time it's a different thing but until then i guess you have to wait never confuse friendship with cooperation these are two different things you can cooperate with your countries which you have had literally no cooperation with over the years you can still cooperate with north korea if you want to if you uh really think that it is going to give you some gains but i'm just saying that you know it's not friendship cooperation is cooperation friendship is friendship these are two different terms that is why even when countries offered ventilators uh, uh liquid oxygen uh, containers and and many more equipment they kept saying aid 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 you know in their statements we are offering aid to india as a mark of friendship or something but aid is a very Uh, is a term that you need to understand here aid is often used if the country thinks that it is like you it's more of a dependency that is created like for example if a first world nation tells a developing nation that we are offering you an aid it is not out of uh, non reciprocity it is often that you can always you might have to concede a lot of things on ground to seek that aid so that is why you would have remembered what jay uh, you know our foreign minister said s jay shankar he said what you call as aid we call as friendship so india is very sensitive about using the word aid because we are a developing nation at the end of the day and anything that is looked as uh, foreign aid it tends to be kind of a problem in the end where we think that we are depending on the world on day to day problems and that is not the attitude that we need to run yeah. exactly yeah. that's all for now sir yeah it was a quite good time spent and thank you very much for being here and thank you very much for sharing all your knowledge with us and you know at a point of time we run behind convincing people you know convincing souls at a time uh, we run behind you know establishing our autonomy end of the day we must even remember that there might be a point where we all should be united at least at the aspect of threat to our living you know um, until then you know we are uh, behind colonizing mars we are behind uh, you know achieving something great above our limits but still we must even work upon making our earth look good for our living and uh, that's where the study of this you know international relations come up to a great work and uh, thank you very much uh, it was very kind of you being here thank you for being here let's hope for the best let's meet up soon thank you brother it's my it's been a pleasure and i wish you the best of luck thank you